All right. Now, on to what is not mil spec. So, what do I mean, not mil spec? Well, a manufacturer can choose for various reasons to deviate from the specifications given originally for the rifle and what is in the technical packages and uh, specifications for the uh, M16 and M4 series rifles. Now, as I've explained, an AR cannot have any uh, selective fire capability, therefore it can't really be mil-spec in that regard. It can never be fully mil-spec, but it can at least be mil-spec in shape, size, and materials in all the ways that really matter. Now, why would a manufacturer not uh, meet mil spec or deviate from mil spec. Well, they can do this for many reasons. Uh, one, the, they can use materials that they uh, that are considered superior than the materials of, in the specifications, or they can use materials that are considered inferior than the specifications. Uh, they may uh, change dimensions for various reasons. Um, because of their manufacturing process and in general there are just different ways that you can uh, deviate um, primarily being buffer tubes, barrels, bolts um, being the big ones uh, if you get a billet uh, receivers uh, they tend to be uh, spec'd differently in outward dimensions, usually in interior dimensions, mag wells, um, you know, things like, and the trigger uh, area where the trigger's housed will all be mil spec because they need the parts to be compatible, but they will deviate from dimensions and shape on the outside for added strength or various other reasons, uh, even uh, cosmetic reasons. So, Mil spec plus. Um, it's a term you can see uh, floating around, and that generally means that the manufacturer is using materials that it feels are superior than the, speci uh, the specified materials. And in other times, you will see uh, materials that are not mil spec, uh, and those are usually done for cost reasons. Uh, having receivers made of 6061 instead of the 7075, for example. Uh, 6061 is a cheaper alloy, but it is considered inferior uh, for the receiver because of the uh, stresses that the receiver goes under. Um, for most people, it's not a problem because they don't put their uh, rifle under a lot of stress. They're not uh, subjecting them to the rigors of a combat environment like the military would be. But some people do uh, attend rifle classes and um, other things in which they do put the rifle through very similar stresses uh, that a uh, soldier would in the field or during training. So that's when things like that can start to matter. Now, one of the main places where you're going to see a deviation is your buffer tube. Now, why is that? Well, the, there's a different way of manufacturing a buffer tube than the, than the method that is used to make a, the standard mil spec buffer tube. This method is quicker and cheaper, so it, they can make parts at a lower cost. So they will do that method, but that method makes a uh, buffer tube that has a different diameter. It is slightly larger in diameter, meaning that any stock that's designed to fit tightly on a mil spec buffer will not fit on a commercial buffer. So why is it different? Well, it comes in how the part is formed. In a commercial buffer, they form the tube and then they cut the threads into that tube 
to uh, thread into the back of the receiver. So, in order to do that, the receiver has to be slightly, or the buffer tube has to be slightly larger so they can cut the threads into it and the threads be correct. On a mil spec buffer tube, the threads are actually a larger diameter than the tube is. It's only slightly, but they are, uh, the outward dimensions of the threads are actually larger. So, the tube, the thread is cut into the tube and then the tube is actually milled and uh, cut down into shape afterwards. That's why you'll see the uh, back end of the threads have flat spots from where the, the milling machine came up and milled up into the thread just a little. Um, why does it matter? Well, as I mentioned, stocks designed for a mill spec uh, tube uh, will not fit a commercial tube. Uh, another reason is, uh, oftentimes, the commercial tubes are made of 6061. I don't think I have ever seen a commercial buffer tube that was made out of 7075 aluminum, like the spec says. Um, so, if you got a commercial buffer tube, you do not have the 7075 aluminum, most likely. Uh, another thing to watch out for is you will see buffer tubes that are labeled mil spec diameter. And what that means is that it is dimensionally the same as a mil spec buffer tube and it will accept uh, stocks designed to fit a mil spec buffer tube. But that generally is code for same size, wrong material, meaning it is a 6061 aluminum rather than 7075. So if you, if it matters to you, you need to make sure you check the description of the part and that it labels it as being made of 7075. I've seen, I've seen many that don't that don't use as obvious of code of being mil spec diameter. And they'll just say mil spec, and they mean only mil spec diameter, not fully mil spec. Another place where you can see deviations is the barrel. You can see deviations for various reasons. Uh, one, there are many different steels available to make barrels. Um, that are very good steels, just not the specified steel. 4140 steel has been around a very long time to make barrels, and this is a very good barrel uh, steel. It is a little softer than the 4150 that is the spec, and it does not last under heavy vol uh, volumes of fire and large round counts, not as long anyway. So, if you are a high volume shooter, that can matter. If you are a low volume shooter, a standard 40, 40, uh, 4140 barrel would be plenty fine. Um, I have seen 4140 barrels that were chrome lined and that will give them close to uh, 4150 uh, chrome lined barrel life. But not quite uh, the same. Uh, generally the heat, uh, the performance when subjected to high heats when you do a lot of rapid fire is where the performance is uh, less with 41, uh, 4140. But you, if you're, unless you are shooting ma large numbers of magazines one right after another, usually you won't get your barrel too hot to really be a problem. Other steels, you can see stainless steels used for the barrel. Usually stainless steel is a uh, barrel or used in barrels that are made for precision. Um, it's a little easier to work with than carbon steels. So it's easier to make a very smooth uh, bore in the barrel, make it meaning it'll be more accurate. There are many different types of Stainless steels, all with different hardness levels and toughness properties, things like that. Um, and not all stainless steel barrels are created equal. A cheap stainless steel barrel made poorly will, shoot, will not shoot well just because it's stainless steel. Now, there are uh, other types of steel as well. FN likes to release barrels for ARs that 
are made from the same steel that they use to make their, the saw machine gun. So it is a steel and uh, it is a barrel making uh, made with a different type of steel and usually the chrome lining is also thicker. They usually line the uh, do a double thick um, chrome line. And this is for the machine gun because these things are uh, belt fed high rates of fire and that is what they're designed for. So they needed a barrel that could withstand that abuse. So generally the steel is a little bit tougher than the standard 4150 with a double th uh, thick chrome lining means it can withstand uh, even more abuse in the long term. Most people would never need it, uh, but I've seen them for reasonable prices uh, that are about the same as standard chrome line barrels. And they are well-made barrels. They're cold, ha cold hammer forged, which is uh, not spec, but it is considered superior way of making a barrel because it uh, strengthens the steel. And uh, generally, I would consider it a mil-spec plus type of barrel. Uh, I don't know who BCM uses to make their barrels. Do they have chrome uh, uh, hammer forged barrels? This is one, but they do not advertise it as, a, as having a double thick uh, chrome lining. Uh, my Palmetto State, on the other hand, is this is one of their premium uh, uppers with the uh, cold hammer forged FN barrel with the double thick lining. So. They are out there at reasonable prices, and uh, I really like those barrels. I find them to be very accurate. So there can be benefits to deviating from mill spec, especially in a barrel. Now, bolts are another area. Uh, there are some steels that are slightly tougher, uh, more resistant to uh, shock and uh, stresses so, uh, that a bar uh, bolt will be subjected to during firing. Um, these steels tend to be more expensive, so that's the reason why you don't see them used as often except in premium rifle builds. Um, the amount of increase of performance, and it's hard to say, I, I, I've seen one figure that was like around 10% uh, increase in toughness of uh, when you uh, run the raw numbers of the, comparing the steels. So who knows how well much of a difference that makes in the rifle. But technically it is at least slightly stronger than the mil spec. Where you'll see it deviate in the other direction is sometimes they will make bolts from 8120 steel, which is the same steel used in the bolt carrier. Um, these bolts tend to not last as long. Uh, I hear lots of stories of people that will get, uh, they'll get a few thousand rounds out of them uh, before they start to break, where the mil spec one can run for 20,000 rounds. So that is an area where I suggest you don't skimp on your bolt. That is a very important part. It's one of the most important parts. The bolt and your barrel are the heart of the rifle. And I tend to say, make sure those are quality. That way you don't have to worry about them uh, breaking on you. Um, even if you just need a cheap plinker, at least get a proper bolt, just so you have the peace of mind that it won't uh, break. Because that is a, 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 the bolt does take a lot of stress. Um, a uh, 4140 barrel, on the other hand, is perfectly fine for a low watt machine. Now, Nitriding, um, that's an area where you can see difference. Uh, the uh, specs for steel in uh, NAR is a magnesium phosphate uh, parkerizing finish. Nitriding is a uh, nitrogen salt uh, uh, salts uh, treatment in which uh, salts of nitrogen Salt, to uh, be clear, salts are a type of chemical bond uh, or a family of uh, compounds. They, they 
generally are category, categorized by uh, the type of uh, chemical bonds uh, of the uh, molecules. And they can be all kinds of different, uh, made from all different kinds of uh, elements. Um, so it's more than just table salt. Uh, table salt reacts uh, with steel to create rust, as most people know, or to accelerate oxidizing and other creation of rust. Nitriding, on the other hand, it's a nitrogen salt, or uh, other similar salts, in which the salts are actually heated to the point where they are molten, uh, literally like lava. And then you will take the steel parts and you will, you will dip them into this salt and it will allow the ions and the various uh, elements within the salt to react with the steel and impregnate down into the steel and change the steel at a molecular level um, or the atomic level I should say. It's uh, it is a treatment, it is not a finish. It is considered a case hardening treatment. And it makes the steel much harder, uh, much more corrosion resistant, and it also adds a bit of, uh, it lowers the uh, coefficient of friction of the metal as well. And it's only a th on, the th on a thin layer, uh, about as thick as a standard uh, chrome lining layer would actually be. Um, but that's enough. Um, nitride barrels are said to be just uh, last just as long or longer than a chrome lining. And it's a process that's been used in Europe for a while. It's been used in uh, well in Europe to make barrels for a while, and it's also been used in in an industrial way for a very long time. So it's a well-known process for making a uh, for treating metal and. A lot of people consider it a superior method, and I am inclined to agree with them. I think it actually creates a uh, superior barrel because uh, none of the drawbacks of the chrome lining, in which uh, uh, chrome lining can crack and peel if done improperly or after uh, you put a lot of rounds through the barrel. And nitriding will just simply start to wear. and. Uh, it's a very tough finish. Now, if to if you to some familiarity, uh, if you're familiar with the Glock Tenifer finish, that is a nitriding type of finish. Uh, Smith and Wesson M&Ps use it, uh, use a similar process for their slides. H and K does as well. Um, so it's out there, and you're probably familiar with it if you have uh, any uh, familiarity with other firearms. So, you know that you can know it's a good finish. So, remember though that cheaply done nitriding is not as good as properly done nitriding. Nitriding, the entire process is a three part process uh, called quench polish, qu qu quench, polish, quench. Um, and if you deviate from that, you can create it surface that is fairly tough but not as good as it could be if you did uh, as it would be if you'd done the full process so keep that in mind not all nitriding barrels will be made equally